For today, we'll just have a very simple program. Uh, at first, I will introduce our speaker for today, um, and then we'll have the input. Um, our speaker has uh, quite an interesting uh, lecture prepared for today. Uh, and then after that, we will have the question and answer. So we're live streaming via Zoom as well. Uh, I mean, by Facebook and YouTube live on the University of the Philippines Baguio's accounts. Um, All right, so I will introduce our speaker. Um, Malaya Palitan Tran is a current Fulbright Research grantee. She gra they graduated from Pitzer College with a self-designed degree in Indigenous Public Health and a minor in Environmental Analysis. Their senior thesis examined the figure of the Igorot Filipino American soldier and the complexities of masculinity, death, and bias citizenship. Their recent forum post in Allen Journal's special issue on Oceanic Philippine X studies reflected on Mauna Kea as a site of indigenous futurities and the navigation of indig indigeneity in diaspora. Current research interests include indigenous studies, environmental justice, and ethnic studies. So please let's give a round of applause to Malaya. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, thank you for coming. Thank you for the CSC for helping me to organize this talk and for helping me throughout the research process. Thank you to my family for coming out as well. Um, this is an undergrad presentation for my Fulbright research grant and a summary of my research progress so far. Um, many of the ideas in this presentation are still in progress as there is a bit of delay in the research process, which is welcome. And as many of you who do research are probably very familiar with, um, so I look forward to sharing and having everyone kind of engage with these ideas today. And it's fun that I can see my office mates over there and we have lots of wonderful professors here today. And hello to everyone online. Um, so usually when I introduce myself, I include a land acknowledgement to locate myself in relation to the place that I've come to. In addition to the set of relations that have allowed me to reach where I am today. Land acknowledgements in the context of Turtle Island, or what many of you are familiar with as North America, have become trivialized and often ring empty as they don't include any tangible discussion of a return to land. So when reflecting on if I should do a land acknowledgement, it didn't quite feel right. So rather than a land acknowledgement, I will do a bit of a lengthier introduction to situate myself in relation to you, the audience, um, the places I have come from and come to, as well as more broadly my research. This is a chance for all of us to think about our relationality to obligations and this idea of scale, especially given our current context of being in the Cordillera. Um, I'd like to make this clear from the outset. We have the next slide. <laughs> um, I'm not claiming that my research is decolonial in any way. As Stephanie Yang discussed, and decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, decolonization is not converting indigenous politics to a Western doctrine of liberation. It is not a philanthropic process of helping the at risk and alleviating suffering. It is not a generic term for struggle against oppressive conditions and outcomes. The broad umbrella of social justice may have room underneath for all of these efforts. By contrast, decolonization specifically requires the repatriation of indigenous land and life. Decolonization is not a metonym for social justice. So rather, this research aims to be anti-colonial. So now let me give you an example of scale and the way that we think about relations in Indigenous studies, as I introduce myself to you. So if you've not already been exposed to these ideas of polarity, um, these ideas of relationality, conceptually in your courses, I'm positive all of you encounter these in your daily lives. So once again, my introduction, my name is Malaya Kosin-Chan. On my mother's side, my family is from Tadjan Mountain Province in Pidigo Lopez Norte. On my father's side, my family is from Gambia in the north of Vietnam. And Kankana Aiguro in Wakano Vietnamese. I was born and raised on the island of Oahu, nurtured and supported by a community of aunties and uncles committed to Hawaiian sovereignty and Aloha Aina, as well as diaspora Philippine X community dedicated to challenging their own relationships and complicities in settler colonialism. I can already feel some of you rolling your eyes <laughs> at the word Philippine X. If any of you follow Twitter arguments, I'm sure you've traced these. 
And if you want to talk to me about this term separate from this talk, we can. I feel like those of you online might be the ones who want to talk to me about this. Um, but I think the framing might be a generative way for you to understand why the term Philippines is used in that. So for college, I went to Pitzer in Southern California, where the Tonga are the traditional caretakers of the place, known to many as LA or Los Angeles. There I learned to challenge my own positionality in relation to conflict through so concepts of diasporic indigeneity, belonging, and responsibility. So now you're full brain. I'm here. Okay. So relations and scale. Stick with me. When I introduced myself, I shared my name, where my family is from, where I was born and raised, and where I went to college. This outlines who I am related to or share him with, the places that I have responsibility to, and the sets of obligations and relations that have helped me to get to where I am today. Relations and obligations can also extend beyond just humans. It can include mountains, rivers, animals, oceans. Sorry, next slide, please. Um, as well as ancestors and spirits. And I think that many, if not all of you, encounter this in your daily lives, especially here, because it's your last name, your hometown, or even where you went to school, identify a particular set of relationships or kinship obligations that you have. The next slide. When we add multi in front, so multi scalarity, it becomes across different scales. So, Katarina Tewa, um, a Bonavin uh, E.P. Rabaki, an African American heritage in her book Consuming Ocean Island, crosses the scale several times through different mediums such as film, archives, oral tradition, personal history, and chemical mineral types of scale, creating a rich and textual history of Bonava and phosphate mining. Inspired by her work and other interdisciplinary artists or scholars, so some other work um, through looking at um, mining, also looking through uh, the use of pesticide and tracing hormones. So, those of you who are familiar with SPS studies or science technology studies, this is often where it's traced through. Um, my research through an assemblage of archival photos, social media, interviews, and creative projects engages with large scale mining in Montaya through multiple scales. So this multi-scalar approach provides a generative framework to understand large-scale mining through a complex of relations that cross temporal scales, so scales of time, such as American colonial time, present time, previous management or current management, spatial divisions such as geographical divisions of land uh, via geology mapping for resources, divisions of land via concepts of ancestral domain, municipality, when we think of the level of barangay, Social kind of scales such as family, friends, community, or communities. Um, cultural, so we have our ethno linguistic groups here, so Kalinga, Kanikanae, Ivoloi, um, or even Gora. And then we have also material scales, so like ore bodies, minerals, chemicals. So we think about copper, we think about cyanide, and bodily scales. So we also think about organs or the hormones or the blood that courses throughout your body in the ways that that is also a scale of and a form of analytic. So um, this picture here is from the archives. Thank you, Simone and Jimmy, who's here for <laughs> introducing me to Monica Christie, um, who showed us these photos. And so later I'll talk a little bit about um, the work that we did with showing elders these archival photos. But when we talk about time, right, and the ways that we travel through time and we travel through different scales, one of them was be looking at these old photos. And then when I talked about mineral scale, um, this here is actually a sculpture that one of the participants made in the creative activity. Um, we hinted before that everyone's going to have a little bit of a different presentation than normal, so I'm actually going to be having everyone do the creative activity with me. Um, and so this is one of the things that actually came out of it. Okay. Um, and yeah, so thinking of these different scales as a generative framework to construct a history and to treat people's current experiences within larger systems while not losing the importance of specificity. Yes. So as Max Laborian, an issue scholar, discusses in their work on plastic as colonialism, Scale is not about relative size. Scale is about what relationships matter within a particular context. Scale is a way to talk about this ontological shift, where the processes that matter or relations are of a fundamentally different sort at different scales, without severing relations that cross scales. What about the difference um, between types of kin of scale? Or you can talk about the differences between types of kin of scale. This also provides a helpful framework to understand the different obligations a minor as to environmental responsibility compared to a mining company in a world impacted by global climate change. When we talk about scale and obligation, 
we think about the love of different models of that, right? So what are the obligations that you have to each other here in this room? Maybe some of you as professors have different obligations to students, but you have different obligations to your family. You have different obligations maybe to the person who helps you with your groceries. This is the way we can think about scale and relationalities. And once again, when I refer to these um, obligations and responsibilities, it can mean varying things for different people. So in the past, think of the end current time, right? This can look like wealth distribution. That means that someone who's wealthy needs to be able to butcher the pig. Um, or it can also look like someone who needs to pray every day. Or this can also look like um, an obligation that when your aunt comes to visit, that you have to host her. So these are the different types of obligations that you have based on your camp. So now you might be thinking to yourself, wow, that was a really long way to introduce yourself and this concept. So why don't you just get to the point? Well, another critical part of relations in these sets of obligations is thinking through, of course, the ethical obligations of research, so things like pre-priority informed consent, ethical review board approval, which is why my research actually um, it's delayed a bit, so I only started interviewing as in March, so that's why there's a little bit of delay. Um, but there are also a set of obligations. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, as a diasporic in Barat, and arguably as a researcher who occupies a position of power due to being backed by a US funded research grant, graduating from a US institution, and enrolled in English that I must follow. Linda T. Y. Smith, in her book, Decolonizing Methodologies, discusses this concept of insider research. So insider research has to be as ethical and respectful as reflective and critical as outsider research. It also needs to be humble. It needs to be humble because the researcher belongs to the community as a member with a different set of roles and relationships, status and position. The role of an official insider voice is also problematic. So this is where I would like to reflect personally on my positionality as a diasporic who grew up, who grew up speaking English and a little bit of Vietnamese at home. Learn some Olelo Hawaii through hula in school and study Chinese in high school. My loco and Kanaai in Tagalog still there so far. I'm trying to learn it now, but obviously does not make up for years of not hearing or learning these languages at home. Knowing a language is more than just being able to communicate and understand each other. It is also where shared values, understandings, and culture are taught and communicated. So as a diasporic abroad, I occupy more of an outsider space. But once my family name and where I'm from is shared, I'm brought into the quote unquote inside. This is complicated, and I could probably spend a whole paper on this, but I highlight this as a part of the research process was learning where to take a step back and also learning where there may be reluctance to share or concepts that I may miss as a whole because of my lack of language skills. Um, if you want to look into this further, there's also work on how native is a native anthropologist. Um, but tangibly, you can go to the next slide. This looked like the translation of all the materials I used with interviewees to Konfanai in local and Tagalog, so the materials were accessible. There's now a great hand. <laughs> um, she was the one who did the hard work of all the translation. Um, and that's me and thought, also, after this presentation, we're not done with the research process. And as I will discuss later, I'm working on deliverables to be given back to the participants. And one of those is an anthology. And as of last week, we actually started giving people back drafts of their pages with their quotes and needs to get their thoughts on them. And as of this weekend, we started editing them to reflect the changes that they wish to see. Similarly, in who I cite, this is a way of also acknowledging the ideas of the mentors, scholars, and community members that have come before me and helped shape my current ideas. I would like to acknowledge that maybe gaps in my citation, as much of my academic training, informal and formal, has been shaped by growing up in Hawaii and going to college in California. I have done my best to include more wrote scholars within the framing of my work and will continue to work on this as I work towards an academic paper. Um, before I go any further, I'd like to explain the structure of the research process, some of the difficulties that we encountered along the way, which is the next slide, please, um, and the deliverables I'm working towards. So to start, the first half of my time was intended to conduct a lit review visit archives and figure out the details of ethical review prior and the FKC process. Well, as many of you understand, time moves differently for a variety of reasons. So we actually didn't end up getting full ethical review board approval until March. So a lot of our time in early 2023, for Melody and I was spent, well, for Melody was spent translating consent forms and questions. And for me, I spent reading her sources and reworking my ethical review board application several times. I think I ended up going through Three or four different ethical review boards until I found one that would actually read my application. 
Um, we also made preliminary visits to Mong Kai and to spoke about the place, the ground housing, and paid courtesy visits to various people in the municipality. So this is how we ended up with 15 interviewees, all who are extremely generous with their time. And when we talk about indigenous research, it's also important to pay attention to community silences, where we encounter no in several different ways. And um, in some cases, it was more explicit. We had people outright say, no, we don't want to be interviewed. And in other cases, it was avoiding certain topics or being more closed off. Gregoria mentions the importance of paying attention to these no's and the nonverbal signs of lack of consent. And the two of us did our best to pay attention to these signs and not to push any further. Um, there were three groups of respondents. We had mine workers, their family members, and elders. I chose these three groups due to either the direct experience of large scale mining or their first time witnessing of any changes in the community as a result of large scale mining. Looking back on it now, if I had more capacity, I would have included community members that fall outside of mining, such as farmers. However, due to time constraints and being a two person team, that wasn't quite possible at the time. The research process consisted of two semi structured interviews and a creative activity that I keep hinting at. The first interview session was centered around participants' relationships to the mines, such as their specific job in the mines. Um, or how they came to find out about mining. The second interview asked about people's perceptions of land, health, and mining. Um, the creative activity initially was intended to be in the middle of the first and second interview. However, due to time constraints, we ended up conducting the creative activity one-on-one -on -one, um, and in several different ways. All of you will get to experience the activity in the second part of the presentation. An unexpected portion of our project, the next slide, please. Um, arose when I paid a visit to the archives. And so this is from uh, the pictures from showing the archival photos of the elders. This is from the main photographs of the Burton Bolt collection, the Free Yellow Northern Zone Historical Archives. So we actually showed these photos to a couple of the elders who had worked in the Panto and were able to get their description. This is also what I'm working on right now is um, matching the photos with the captions. Ooh, yes. Okay. Um, the reason I decided to undertake this research to begin with is because I'm interested in complicating ideas of indigenous people as having a unifying ethics around protecting nature, land, water, and culture. In part, because my own family is taking part in mining. My great grandfather worked for Lepanto as a security guard. My grandfather attended Lepanto National High School as a result. I have a feeling there are several of you in the audience, whether online or in person, who have also some sort of connection to mining in the region, whether family, friends, or acquaintances. This is why I'm interested in understanding the role of large scale mining in shaping communities and the lives of individuals. Mining has played a heavy role in shaping the history and livelihoods of the growths and people who come to the Cordillera for work. Oftentimes, there's a tendency to romanticize IPs while they seem to be marking them as the other. I, like many other indigenous scholars, artists, and activists, am interested in specificity and complicating this one dimensional perception. Um, those of you familiar with Kerbin, um, all of you have work on reclaiming the indigenous body, discourse, social media, and aesthetics of different activism. Um, there's really interesting work on the work of subversion of the other, um, and what that looks like. Um, uh, but in particular, I am interested in adding texture and nuance to the decisions that IDs make, especially when they're not palatable or deemed quote unquote corrupt or aligned with these ideas of protection and natural resources. Quote, unquote, corrupt. Now, before I go any further, I mentioned land several times, and the concept of land is hard to define, but I'd love to hear this definition. Um, <laughs> Defining land makes it sound like a noun, but land is a verb. A bay is a noun, only water is said. Collaborators Eve Tuck and Marsha McKenzie write that land is both a notion of a and an action. Land never settles. It is about relations between the material aspects some people might think of as landscapes water, soil, air, plants, stars, and history, spirit, events, kinships, accountabilities, and other people that aren't human. These relations are happening all at once rather than being parceled into individual paired units like plant to soil, mother to daughter. We have some plant mother soil, um, plant mother going on. But this is not to romanticize the concept of land or these sets of relations as they're often messy and have been shaped and influenced by colonization. Um, as Yernando Rubilos and Victoria Golden Corpus explain in their chapter on the politics of resource extraction, indigenous people, multinational corporations, and the state, um, the Spanish Rebellion Doctrine reconfigured geospatial relationships so all land was presumed to belong to the Spanish crown, and as a result, ended up belonging to the nation, so the Philippine nation state, 
And this is a rewriting and reorienting of relationalities. And the regalian direction in disregarded indigenous people's customary concepts and practices of land use and ownership. The result was a history of displacement from their ancestral land and domains each time a government project or a private company with government backing intruded into their territories in the name of national development. Finan also explains how American colonial administration reconfigured the Cordillera as well in the making of the Euro. It's explained by several scholars. Um, one is here, and the CSC also worked on this project. The policies passed by the Philippine government, such as the Mining Act of 1995 and IPRA, often come into conflict and are implemented unevenly. So once again, I'd like to thank my members and for pointing this report out to me, Paula for sharing and writing up the final report, and the CSC research team that worked on this report as well. Um, lands, which in many cases have now become synonymous with ancestral domain, as laid out by IPRA, has become a complicated and oftentimes messy term or concept. The next slide, please. Um, this is actually a quote from one of our interviewees about the way that he understands land when they asked. He said that I tend to think about how people socialize more than the land. When you say ancestral domain, people will think about the land as is. But I prefer to look at the exchanges and experiences of people living in that area. The imaginary land that they can transfer to their children, not the physical land. Because if you speak of the land, then that will be the cause of war, the cause of chaos. So I'm going to take a moment for me to breathe <laughs> and have everyone look at all these photos. These are actually photos um, from Lepanto. On the top left, we have the airstrip. On the top right, we have the um, tram that's used to bring uh, materials overhead. On the bottom left, we have the golf course that's inside of Lepanto. And the bottom right, we have a view of the school, Lepanto National High School from far away. And um, on the left, you can't quite see it in this image, but the CPJ or the community center. So take a moment to look at all this photo. Um, so one of the threads I'd like to focus on is a negotiation between people's different dreams and desires for their community and more broadly, Lepanto and Ramangkayan. I'm going to share a snippet from the paper I'm working on regarding the Lepanto as a space for dreams and desires for the future of conflict. And then I also share some of the interviewed answers when we ask them, what are your hopes and dreams for the community? So Lepanto is a space of limbo between both community and not community, exclusionary and inclusive, wealthy and not wealthy. Lepanto is a space of negotiation where colonial desires meld with corporate, both clashing and consuming community wishes for different possibilities. The elsewhere that people speak of is both abroad and in Mongkayan, and elsewhere with more mines, more minerals, but also an elsewhere with more farming and less mining. An aspiration for a place that centers the future of the youth through education, protecting natural resources, and meeting mining quotas. Mongkayan is a place where people dream of an elsewhere, not always necessarily a spatial elsewhere, but an imagined elsewhere where community needs are met and everyone is thriving. For some, this is rooted in a recent past, an American colonial period where apples, milk, and Christmas gifts are plenty. For others, it's a return to Ubo, to sharing burdens and collecting action. Mongkayan is a reflection in many ways of the complexity of late stage capitalism and long term scale extraction projects, where companies, in recognition of their eventual decline due to their extraction of finite resources, begin to conceptualize their elsewhere as more mining or transition out of the community. These conflicting desires for an elsewhere create a complex present where desires are negotiated through different modes, such as free prior informed consent, protests and strikes, through community relation outreach, reclamation of space by residents, etc. And so I want to read one of the quotes from one of the interviewees who talks about, um, once again, the question that we asked, or what are your hopes for the community? Um, so Romeo answered, I want my family to experience the old fresh air. If the time comes, because right now pollution is prevalent. If we cannot control the pollution because of the chemicals, nothing else, as they say, there's no hope for it. We have to control it if possible so our children like you and your children too will experience the fresh air, not the pollution. Um, Antonio from Munson Province talked about, we should bring back by any time, bring back the elders' customs before that there should be a deaf eye where they have storytelling so that if they drink something good, we can also learn from it. We also call it, Ubo or Tulong Tulong. Our aim here in Mangkayan is the Nadam, Bayanihan, and Ubo. This means the same thing. Right, next slide. Uh, Lina from Palinga says not to generalize it, but the company dictates that if we target the goals and go above, then the community will also benefit. Then their fathers and mothers will also have an increase in salary. The children will also be given goods. 
There's a lot of problems that the company is facing nowadays. If you remember our pensioners, um, a little side note. So the pensioners in November are not um, being paid their SSI. So there's been a delay in that. Um, my wish is to have more veins, to have more production to mines and the community also gain here to get up. Being in mining engineering, for me, it always saves you first. Actually, the Pumpa is a very good company also. In my opinion, in all of the mining companies I go to, it's the best community is the Pumpa. Our next slide. Um, Zadina from Hungusinan. I hope that the community of the Pumpa, just like before, must be friendly with one another and cooperative. I wish them to be united with one another. I want the old Lepanto back. I hope that it will go back the same way as before, get back up again. For example, the benefits and everything will go back. For example, the maintenance, especially of the housing and the cleaning is the beautification of the surroundings. So I showed you whole pictures before of what um, the Lepanto looks like now. Our next slide. This is from Angela, um, 24. Lepanto is a mining village. There's very little job opportunities unless it is in the mines. It would be really good if they develop others or if they would be less mining dependent because I've seen when they lay off a lot of people, a lot of my batch moves them back to their provinces because they don't have a house. They don't have a job, any, any job opportunities there. Um, that's the thing about rural unemployment, rural poverty. I think in the Philippines and everywhere else in the world, poverty is more rural based and it's the same there in Long Haim. A lot of people in my community usually go abroad and I think that's one of the things that I really hated growing up. I felt like that's the only opportunity that I have or the only road that I can take in order to get up the social ladder. I wish there were more opportunities in the rural areas and maybe overall, if we'll stop sending Filipinos abroad, maybe we can start creating more jobs here. So as you can see by all those quotes, there's a tension between colonial ideas of land as resource and land for the next generation. So we saw between the mining engineer and the elders, the different ways that they thought about land um, conceptually and seeing land as an attractive uh, a space for extraction versus seeing it as something that needs to be passed on through generation. Um, we also see a desire for a past under American leadership as Sabina talks about the past she refers to is, is something that actually comes up in a lot of the editor interviews. I didn't have quite, um, I didn't wanna pull everyone's interview because it'd be quite long if I did that, but they refer a lot of people refer to the past where Lepanto is under American leadership and there is more frequent gift giving. So every Christmas, um, the kids get gifts. Basically, um, it used to be, I believe, up until high school, but now I think it's like between ages zero to seven or zero to six. Um, and this desire for an Americanized version of the mining community. So you saw the airstrip, um, something also interesting that you see when you go inside, the sidewalks are really wide. Um, it's paved, there's the old American style colonial building. So there's this desire for that Americanized past. Um, and especially in Pamporali, the Pampo is full of between American colonial architecture and desires. So are reminiscing for a past where times were quote unquote better with current development by residents with old infrastructure falling apart. So we actually saw that a lot of people had moved to the side of the airstrip. Apparently, according to people who are not happy that they're there, they're not supposed to be there. But we can see the ways in which right people have begun to take over the space and these desires for a clean past or a clean American colonial version of the past don't quite match with what people want. So people are beginning to build their own houses, people are beginning to you know continue their farming, things like that. So it's not quite this clean cut desire. And then also the last kind of conflict is between wanting economies that are not reliant on mining. Um, and this is in conflict with people who want more mining, as we see between the two young people, actually, they're not that far apart in age. One wants for there to be more mining in the community or to discover more ores, whereas the other person wants an economy that does not require people to go abroad um, and is focused on creating infrastructure that allows people to stay within the time. Um, I'd also then like to thank here very briefly, Dean Lea, uh, we have, and all the other um, CSC people as well. So, um, we also talked to Mom Ruth a little bit, I also talked to Mom Grace, Mom Paula about my research, and so their ideas have actually helped me to shape um, this analysis and this kind of discussion around people's requirements, particularly with Umaya, around um, people's desires and the ways in which they carry it out. So it's a very generative launching place. Thank you. Okay, our next one, please. All right, so um, we're going to talk about biopolitics and biocitizenship. Um, and I mentioned in the beginning, I would talk a little bit about health. So people's understandings of health have often become focused around self-regulation. And this is where biocitizenship becomes a generative framework. 
I'm gonna take a moment. I don't know how well you can see this. Um, I want you to look at this side on the right, yeah. Um, this is LaFunza's safety record. Um, when you enter, you have to pass through two security gates. Um, and after the one, before you get to the PC layer, the community center, you see the safety record. I want everyone to take a moment to look at it. Um, kind of observe. That's awesome. Let's go down a little bit as well. So you can see here it says you're God's greatest creation at work or at play. Please take safety with you in the safety department. Safety first, be careful, the safe way is the best way. And sustainable mining, a treasure tradition in our operation. So we can go to the next slide. We also have these signs that are faded over time. Um, but the one on the left basically says arrive alive. Value your life and property, driving safely and defensively. Right. Basically, take safety with you is what this one says. Okay. So, discuss biopower a little bit in biopolitics. So, if biopower describes the numerous and diverse techniques for achieving the subjugation of bodies and the control of populations, and biopolitics names the expansion and intensification of biopower via a set of mechanisms through which the basic biological features of the human species become the object of a political strategy. Then biocitizenship might be described as the instrumentalization of biopower authorized by the forces of biopolitics to legitimate certain subjects of the state. One might thus classify actions such as compulsory vaccinations, quarantines, and fitness programs for school children as examples of state biases and care practices designed to construct a normative normal body. So when you think about this, you can think about this also in the ways that people have begun to be all biomedical language or what people are more familiar with as Western medicine to get what they need. So I'm sure many of you, um, uh, at least for me personally growing up in a place where our healthcare system is very complicated and very convoluted, I come in with my list of symptoms and I explain very specifically what I think I need or what I want. And this is the form of biocitizenship, right? It's the ways in which we learn to navigate and learn to wield biomedical language to get what we want. So this actually arose um, out of, I can't remember, but after um, post-nuclear disaster and the ways in which the citizens um, navigated and used their symptoms to get the care that they wanted from the government. And so this is a pivot, right? We think about, again, relationality, we think about scale, and the ways that we approach healthcare or the ways that we approach these ideas of health, this is a pivot um, in these forms of relationality. So the specter of the responsible citizen, a safe miner, one that follows all their precautions and is able to protect themselves and others from the dangers of mining irresponsibly. This form of disciplining is everywhere, as you saw by these pictures, especially from the signs that are all over the premise. A safe citizen is a responsible citizen. A safe miner is a safe community member. And so this, as we talk about the co right, and we talk about the ways in which people begin to police themselves, we can see this with the minors when we talk to them, and they talk about what safety means to them, what health means to them. It's about the ways in which they control their own bodies. And can you go to the next slide, please? Um, as Molly from Kalinga talked about, health, it's an individual responsibility. When you know how to manage, um, when you know how to manage your body, you'll know how to discipline it, because the company provides the equipment or need for work. But the underground is really different from the surface. For me, I don't allow myself to get drunk when I go to work because it's the number one thing I prohibit my men not to do. So when I do that, I can no longer prohibit my men. I'm holding on to that. I'm not drunk when I go to work. And so this idea, right, of the miners controlling themselves to be safe, the miners controlling themselves um, in this way is in many ways a stealer mismatch. So I had mentioned this before. Um, miners are held individually responsible for their health and well-being. When the working conditions that they are put in, particularly the safety precautions they need, are out of their control, such as having enough air underneath underground or having enough water. So many of the interviewees actually talked about the ways in which they would manage their own um, health when the company was not able to provide them with enough water. So um, one of the interviewees talked about creating his own water bottle. So he would drizzle the water on him um, underground. And a lot of them actually um, have safety equipment, but because of the heat, 
mine only in their boots, their underwear, and a hard hat. And so when we think about this, right, when we, um, when you saw that sign before that was talking about like the safe miner is a responsible miner, the responsibility for safe mining goes on to the individual when there are also things, right, that the company themselves are responsible to, to making sure that the miners have these conditions to mine safely. Um, and something that a lot of the older folks talked about as well is that um, at a certain point, some of them were able to work 24 hours underground. And this is something also that the mining company has control over because they know, and which is what they have done. You can only work up to 16 hours now. You cannot work up to 24 hours. Um, but the ways in which right, that's a ceiling right now. Okay, next slide. So we've gotten to the part about my deliverables. So there are different deliverables that I decided on, each for different purposes. The first, the one I'm working on right now, I'm actually working on all of them, but the one I'm focusing on the most, um, should be returned to the community as an anthology. This is a collection of poetry, pictures, songs, interviews, snippets from the participants. The intention of having this anthology as the first deliverable of this research project is to ensure that interviewees' contributions are accessible, first and foremost, to the participants and the community of Mount Hyen. It also means to be a piece that is widely circulated. I'm going to read to you a bit of the introduction I'm working on to explain the anthology a little bit more. Um, you can see it. Let me switch. Um, the creative activity was initially designed with the intention of being a workshop. However, due to time constraints, the activity was conducted more informally. The participants were provided with an open ended prompt with a series of guiding questions. These questions are the following format What do you think of when you hear Mong Hyen? What are the places, sites, scents, tastes, sounds, sensations that come to mind? The word Mong Hyen is replaced in Levanto, mining, health, lands, um, ancestral domain, and community. Each person was encouraged to participate in a way that felt best to them. And as a result, we received a large range of engagement. The purpose of this anthology is to document and share the resulting stories, songs, poetry, pictures, and memories of the creative activity. These recollections include a range of participants from elders to youth, some born, raised, and work with an acronym named their brew in the Panto, and other workers who initially came solely for the mines. Initially, the images, poetry, and songs are meant to stand alone. However, as I began to piece this anthology together, I realized that many of the participants' engagements were enriched by the inclusion of interview excerpts. Due to the more informal process of the creative activity, many of the participants engaged with the questions throughout their interviews. So as a result, I decided to include interview excerpts to provide further context. Um, they're also placed in the context of the pictures in the archives. So it's loosely organized into two overarching themes of mining and community. These are porous descriptors as the two actively meld and shape each other. Due to the range of engagements, the participants' contributions are organized thematically to be in conversation with each other. Each creates reflects the participants' reflection on their life as well as a multitude of perspectives of large stone mining. Um, as you saw, the way I interviewed them, actually, they're, inter they're identified by a pseudonym, unless they ask for otherwise, along with their age and their hometown. Um, the purpose of this identification, I think I talked about relationalities, is to contextualize and situate participants in relation to Mount Hyatt and the Cordillera more broadly. Um, I use this identification method throughout this presentation as well, and then we're going to show you a little preview. You know, okay. This page will not make it. This is why I'm showing it to you. Um, this is the page, basically, probably a little far away for you to read, where one of the participants talks about there's a pond in the pond, though, that's green. Um, and she tells a funny story about the fishes. And she basically says, like, uh, they clean the fish pond every so often, but they're actually no dead fish. So even if the water looks really poisonous, funny to us, um, basically what happens is that they cleaned it. Um, and then some people actually stole them, and then they ate it, and then they had diarrhea after. Um, and why would they eat the fish? The water is so dirty, and the fish is like fed with anything, so they only suck the dirty water. Basically, they find out later that because of the diarrhea, they found out who stole the fishes. Um, but there's a range of stories here, right? So we had people actually share their themes. We had people share funny stories. We had people also share very intense, very sad stories. Um, and a lot of these I'm not going to share with you quite yet because I want to um, first talk to each participant and ask if they're comfortable with their story being shared. Um, so I chose a funnier story that doesn't quite have as much intensity to it. But the next one talks about Christmas. And so this is an archival photo. Um, but you can see here, um, this is the old CPJ or the old community center. It looks very different from the paved 
picture we saw before. Um, but basically, the participants talk about Christmas and they talk about remember getting gifts, they remember getting the apple, they remember getting the t shirt, um, and they remember Santa. And so, when all of the interviews kind of talk about what they think about when they hear the bundle, a lot of people actually said, oh, Christmas or apples or gifts or things like that. Um, so that's one of the memories that people have. Um, two excerpts in the anthology. We'll go to the next page. Um, this is from the zine. Okay, so the zine, the intention for this piece was to engage with archival materials or mining and also be a little bit more creative and form. Um, so I actually made a monopoly board. I had initially intended for it to be playable, but it's not. Um, but if you can look through all the different cards, there are certain things like the Lepanto school bus, which is free. You can also see all the different barangays in Montayan. You can see your community test. You get injured in a mining accident and go to the hospital. You have to pay 5,000 pesos. You also see things like you were caught taking home gold ore, go to jail. So there's all these different kind of ways of talking about um, you know, what is happening in the community and kind of an interesting way, right? When we think about monopoly, monopoly is the way that you acquire property and acquire resources. And so the ways that we can think about um, Mong Haiyan in this way as well. You can also see like your Chanmin house. Um, and if you see Barangay Paco, that's actually where Lepanto is located. So for those of you who are not as familiar, Mong Haiyan is a municipality. Lepanto is the mining community located in, in the Barangay Paco. Um, so you can see with the mining shaft, you can see how much their value increases compared to the other ones that have. You can also see the MPSA values over there to the right. Um, that's the mining agreement. So you can see the different the, the ranges in the types of um, value based off of what is present there. And they also have the Victoria Gold deposit, which is their current deposit that they're working on. Go to the next slide. This here is more from archival stuff. So um, you can see here, this is on the left, I believe is from ooh, American era. And then on the right is Spanish era archives. Basically they talk about, here's, I wanted to bring this up, where they talk about um, land as resource um, in particular and the ways in which the Philippines became divided through these ideas of, um, resource and money rather than right these previous discussions we had around um, land. Um, so this is the other page that is more archival stuff. And then we're gonna play a song. Then we'll then transition down to play. So one of this is one of the songs actually that we shared by the participant. So the transcription um, and the translation is on the board. I'm sorry if it's a little hard to read, but you can all sit and listen to it. How's everyone doing? Okay, good. People ready for a creative activity? Actually, while we wait, um, how many of you would prefer instructions and Tagalog? You raise your hands. We have three options. We have Lopano, we have Tagalog, and we have some Kanai. What would you prefer? Do you have any preferences? We're going to start separating the room. So, you want to all the speakers? Sorry. 
Spontaneously composed for us um, by one of the elders. And so he has to give us a lot of different songs and poems, but I just wanted to share this song with everyone uh, as an example of the creative activity. Um, so that is just the last slide of this presentation. So we're excited. Um, and then we go to the next presentation the creative activity. Okay, so as I was discussing before, um, we have options for everyone. So do we have people who would prefer to all the instructions? <laughs> you can raise your hand, or or we can and um, Melody will come and pass out instructions to you. We have our okay. Any any takers for Tagalog? No. no. Okay. How about English? No. Okay. Loco. I see people making sounds but not raising hands. <laughs> Okay, does that mean everyone else wants to come to Yes? No? <laughs> Over here, you have a come to speaker. Over here? Okay. Okay, but no one else will be with language. They <laughs> have um, English. Once again, any takers? Everyone's going to get a paper. Or you can tell Melody if she wants her. Oh, we have English back there? English, okay. You can see English is back there. So this is actually um, an old, this is from the research itself, and so it's basically what we provide is each of the interviewees talking about the activity, um, the questions, set of questions that we provided as well, um, and basically we're going to all do this together, but for some of you, you might be like, I'm not from Monkai or I don't know about the Pando. So we're going to actually scale this a little bit. So how many of you have any history with mining? No, yes, no. How many of you are familiar with 
I'm writing about mining? Yeah, there we go. Um, with mining here in Bignet, do you have any Phylexians here? Do you have any one from Bignet Corp? No, no kids. Okay, surprising. I thought we would have some more people. Okay, anyway, well, basically, what we're going to do with the first two questions that ask about Mokai and Mapanko um, is we're going to take Bignet and put that there. And then if you had a specific experience with the mining community, we would have put that there. And since we don't, um, how many of you are familiar with the large scale extraction projects in your own communities? So many takers. Anyone familiar with those? Okay, we're going to replace that there with that one instead. So you can choose your Ili or your hometown, your Manangue, wherever you would like for those first two questions. Um, so I'm going to walk us through this activity. And what I'm also going to do, um, because we all love arts and crafts, right? I don't want to hear anyone say they're not creative. That's not true. Um, we're also going to pass out. Paper. Sorry. You're going to have everyone fold their own Z's. We're going to do mini Z's. Um, um, but also, if you are not big on Z's, so it's also okay. You can also find a picture on your phone. You can also, if you're a really great spontaneous composer, you can also spontaneously compose a song. Um, you can also share with us a new poem any short creative writing, anything like that. Um, so you can see here, um, this is one of the zines that I did regarding um, cyanide. And I think I have it here. I'm so sorry, it's so small, which is part of the importance of zines so that you can photocopy and pass them around. But this is a cyanide one. Um, I'm going to unfold it for everyone to see. Uh, but it's what's on the screen in front of everyone. Um, and we're going to all make our own little beans today. Okay, can we go to the next one? So, what are zines? So, these are creative, self created creative, friendly ideas. They can cover topics like your favorite K pop idol, maybe your favorite K pop idol, the best way to plant rice, or even a personal memoir. So, usually, zines are low cost and are organically distributed to photocopies. So, this is why I've chosen to do the beans because you see here, quite easy to make a copy of it and then fold it and pass it out. So it's a great way to also spread information. Um, go to the next slide. So we're gonna all have folders together. Wait, I need to keep it together. Okay. Sorry, I think I just Okay, everyone hold up your sheet of paper. I'm gonna fold it. I've heard this is a weird thing that I did, but hot dog style, oh, hot dog style. Okay. Make a nice crease. And then we're gonna open it again. Hamburger style, so horizontally this way. Yeah, we love food here. Okay, and then we're gonna fold it. How is everyone doing? Yeah, okay, I want everyone to hold up their square so I can see. <laughs> yes, yes, and then square. Okay, okay, we're gonna fold it again one more time, hamburger style. Okay, now I want everyone to unfold it. And count the number of boxes you have. You should have eight. Okay. So we're going to fold it. So everyone have eight boxes. Okay. We're going to fold it hamburger style again. And what we're going to do is we're going to fold it back and forth a couple of times because we're actually going to rip the paper down to the center point right here. So don't rip it all the way down. You don't want to go through all the squares. You only want to rip to this middle square right here. So you keep folding the paper back and forth, it'll give you a nice crease so that when you rip it, it'll rip the illusion. People know where that people understand that, or is that a little confusing? Okay, one more. <laughs> I can see confusion. Okay, okay. So we're gonna see here. There's desks on the chair. Yeah, there's if you fold your, your lift your thing and you fold it out and have a desk on you may fold it easier. Well, I don't even have already got it. <laughs> Have someone who's ahead of the class actually okay. cover it back here. If you need help, look at your neighbor. Is your neighbor doing well, or is your neighbor also confused? <laughs> you can come around and help you. 
write or draw whatever you want based off of what you've been hearing in the presentation so far. Um, how many people have pens in them? None. Okay, I have pens. I also have markers and as a throwback to childhood, we have crayons. Do we have anyone? Okay, I kind of Need you all in this, but I also have extra folded ones. If you ever were I'd be able to fold it, but I wanted everyone to fold it themselves. Extra ones, extra you now. Okay. If you need a pen, a marker, a implement to draw with, please raise your hand. The melody will come and share them with you. If you wanted to use color and you already have a pen, you can also ask for a color. Okay. Um, this is for more for the people who are at home because they can't see the paper in front of them. Um, but we have the questions here in Locarno. Um, so what do you think of when you hear Bampayan? What do you think of when you hear Lepanto? What do you think of when you hear Maimi? What do you think of when you hear Hub? What do you think of when you hear Land and Sasha Remain? And what do you think of when you hear Community? So, like I said before, there are six pages. So you can answer each question on each page if you would like to, or you can also just kind of answer thematically. Maybe some of you want to write a poem. Maybe some of you want to write uh, a song, anything like that. So what I'll also do is toss around the scene that Melody and I made for looking at like everyone works on the movie. Can you get comments for people on them? Mm -hmm. For those of you online, if you have any questions regarding folding, you can place that into the group chat. <laughs> into the chat, into the Zoom chat, not the group chat. If you want to go back to the, um, the first slide, maybe? I think the instructions on folding.
Uh, come to a good stopping point. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I know that wasn't quite enough time, so we're we can continue to draw while we talk. Um, but really quickly, what we're gonna do? You can go to the next couple slides, please. Almost the last one. One more. Yeah. Okay. Um. I know that many of you are focused on your drawing. That's okay. You can focus on that while you also answer the question. Um, is there anything that came up during the activity that you would like to share with the group? And is there anything in particular that you took away from doing this activity, even though you did it for like five minutes? <laughs> is there anything that anyone would like to share? Yeah, if you want to talk on the microphone, you totally can. If you don't, you can also raise your hand. <laughs> Or just spontaneously share. Do you have any takers at home online who did the activity? Do you have any reflections? If not, that's also very okay. 
Um, I'm also a big fan, and this is what we did, of letting people take their zines home and finish it at home and then come back to us. Um, so this is just a way, the tool for all of you to use, um, whether it's for fun in your classes or for later when you work in the community or if you need an activity to do with your kids. Um, I just wanted to share this activity with you. Um, and that is it, presentation-wise. Um, we have time for questions now. So if anyone has any questions regarding the presentation, any questions regarding the Zine workshop, um, please feel free to ask away. Also, for those of you online, you can also put your questions in the chat. Or if you really want to um, finish your Zine, you can also work on that. I totally understand. <laughs> so I can see all of you hyper-focused on it, and I totally understand. I would do the same thing. <laughs> Who wants more colors? Would you like that? Uh, yeah. uh, would you like to some the heavy information regarding for the Mangayan, uh, the mining company, the who was managing? Oh, who's managing the yes. And then the, some of the mapping regarding for the underground you know, digging to uh -huh. since uh, colonial time uh -huh. until now, how to expand the uh, underground uh, uh, digging the site? Uh, it's the, the, how the boundary was big or how to relate to the several community the already the area of the interconnected with who are totally independently separate. Okay. So as I understand it, you're asking uh, who's currently in charge of the company and then how basically did um, the mining spread underground in the ways in which like which communities it fell under and the way that it's basically like mapped, mapped out or the ways that um, we can see how the mines have expanded. Is that your question? Yes. Uh, uh, the, because uh, this underground uh, digging uh, is very important uh, with the also community mm -hmm. side to uh, affect the uh, geologically mm -hmm. underground. So in during the expanded uh, the network of the, this old mining site, uh, will be intact to the nearby the area to some shaking what's on the uh, the collapse of area to some effective so that, that kind of uh, map is actually the I don't know the security issues there or I don't know sure about it but since uh, will be the expanded by from the American colonial time the since starting for the digging time and then now the Laro group Expanded. Mm -hmm. So also the time uh, expanded, also the map will be heavy. So maybe company mm -hmm. uh, Maybe for context, sir, we can uh, introduce ourselves before we ask the question, so we have a little context. Could you uh, could you introduce yourself also, sir? Uh, like from where, where your name and where? Oh, I'm Stephen Jan. I came from South Korea, uh -huh. and I uh, I'm. Uh, recently, I'm living in Baguio, mm -hmm. um, and then the, I'm very interested in the call for the regarding for the mining issue because mining is gold issue is very important part of the story of the Korea. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's okay. why I'm very. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah. Okay, so currently the mining company is under the under the yachts. Um, so it is actually a Filipino owned company. Um, also, can we talk about so? Regarding your question, so basically, I don't have any access to the maps themselves. And so, um, my plan is actually from the landslides to sinking. Um, and there's several explanations for this. So, there's a study that was published after one of the major sinkings that happened. Um, and basically, they had asked the mining company to have access to the map of the underground, and the mining company basically said no. Um, so, those maps are kind of not accessible, but there are some maps that are also accessible through the Mining and Ge Geosciences Bureau. You can also look at and you can see their MPSAs. Um, basically, you can see their the um, 
agreements they have with the government that allows them to mine the land itself. And that is kind of um, more like land parcels rather than actual underground like mapping of underneath. But um, regarding the Pampas process of mining, what they put on their website and what we were informed by one of the engineers, um, their style is cut and fill. So what that means is they cut or they mine and then they backfill. Um, but what a lot of community testimony has said um, and even some miners and engineers, when they talk about it after the sinking, they say that um, the Puento was backfilled, so the community, the mining community, but other areas in Mangkaya were not. Um, and this was something that, um, you know, some of the engineers say and that the community members say. And this was also right when we talk about that conflict with the mining company is saying versus what the community is saying regarding what's happening underground. Um, but a lot of the miners who work underneath have said that they don't exactly backfill. Um, that's why there are problems with um, sinking and landslides and the such. Um, does that answer your question? And I mean, and how wide it is. So, so the thing with um, FPIC or free fire informed consent, before a mining company can go into the community and start mining, post IPRA, they needed to get FPIC. So that basically means they need to get the community's consent to mine. Um, and so what that looks like is a process of doing, um, they go to the community, they basically explain what they're going to do, and then they have to also do kind of like a tour of the area and explain what they're doing there. Um, they have to come to an MOA and, or come to a memorandum of agreement, sign that, agree on that. Um, and then in that process, there's a lot of things that the community can ask for. That's ideally how it would work. Um, oftentimes that's not how it works, and because of how complicated it is historically, right? Lepanto has been around for 86 years. Um, it brought didn't come in until the 90s, so it's not exactly a clean agreement. And so actually what the company is working on right now is getting a PIC uh, for one of their projects because there was a court case that basically said you need to get a PIC even if you um, have been mining in this area for a long time. Um, and basically uh, they have been having a hard time getting that. Um, but when they show maps to the, when they do community presentations, they actually appended some, they show maps um, of what barangay are affected by the mining. Um, and basically what they have to do is get three prior informed consent in every barangay. So in Manghayan, if it's affecting nine of them, they have to go to nine of them and get that consent there. If it leads right into other municipalities, right? And this is something that the community members were like, hey, it's going to be yes or hey, it's going into like Northern province or all these things, and it's, that becomes a wider process for the company. They have to use more resources to go to these different communities and get different FBAs. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, Hello, I'm Paola from the Cordillera Study Center uh, here at UP Baguio. I just wanted to ask, I'm curious about um, the reception of the community to the um, of course, research that's uh, we've done that uh, time and again, but uh, with the creative activity, maybe you can tell us more about how you did that and what the reception was. Yeah, totally. So it's funny because when we had first introduced it, I think people were like, what are you talking about? Um, and this is why I said that it was implemented a little differently. So actually what we ended up doing is a set of questions you see in front of you for some of the people who are less eager to participate. But we did is we just asked the questions and we did it like a word association activity. So what do you think of when you hear Mampaya? And then we got a selection of words. What do you think of when you hear Lepanto? And then we got a selection of words. And so that's how we did it. Um, but some people were really eager. We had um, two teachers actually give us the that they worked on. Um, and then we had, like you saw before, we said we had a sculpture. One of the people who did it was super eager. The one I shared the song from, um, you know, oral tradition style. He just started orating and we just sat there and recorded it and you know he just shared everything about his thoughts he gave he um even shared a prayer with us we shared a lot of different things and so what we tried to do is meet people where they were at and so we obviously got a very mixed reception um which is understandable and i think if we were to do it again in the future if i were to do it again in the future i would love to do it in my workshop setting um but the initial concern with that was safety of course and so my goal, and I don't think I talked about it that much actually, was to ensure that everyone's um, identity stayed anonymous. And so that meant that if we were to do a workshop, that would mean everyone would know who was being interviewed. 
Um, and so maybe that was not the best way to go about it. So that's why we ended up um, going to each person individually and doing the activity with them. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Joel from uh, CHTH Kutibar here. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful presentation. I appreciate it. And uh, this is actually a new way of approaching uh, studies on indigenous peoples, indigenous studies, and uh, other modern, matters related to it. So uh, yeah, I'm very interested when, when the introduction mentioned that you are pursuing uh, studies on indigenous people. And since you also came from uh, you know, the United States, and uh, I'm also uh, I'm aware that you're also uh, aware with the with the different concepts of indigenity in the United States, and which is a separate colonial country and the Philippines. So, uh, my my question is only about indigenity. How were you able to uh, uh, to differentiate or to to uh, I mean, identifying the ones uh, when it comes to the notion of indigenity in the US and also the indigenity concept as applied and uh, embodied by the people of Mankayan who happen to be Kankanae. So uh, just just that, because you mentioned also land acknowledgement, because in the Philippines, we, we rarely or not do land acknowledgement, although we are in an indigenous uh, land, so to speak. So, I'm just interested uh, how that shift from the indigenity in a settler colonial nation is a uh, 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 approach in an indigenity in a non-settler colonial approach, uh, specifically in the Philippines. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I think that's a really great question. Um, there's several parts to this question, so I'm going to do my best to answer it. You might have to come back because um, I'm running on juice of finishing this presentation. So there are multiple parts to that. So I'm going to try my best to answer them in order. So the first part, well, actually, I'm going to answer this backwards because what you just said really stuck to me regarding settler colonialism and coming from the context of North America or Hill Island. So I'd like to clarify also, um, I actually grew up in Hawaii um, and Hawaii is not a part of the United States, right? And we think about it in relation to ideas of foreign sovereignty, Hawaii was illegally overthrown. Um, and I think this is an interest, this is an important shift that I make that I would like to first of all bring up, but also um, talk about the way that this has influenced the way I um, understand the framing of um, indigeneity and also the ways that it applies. So I think, like I said in the introduction, a line of acknowledgement didn't feel like the correct thing to do here. Um, sorry, I feel like this is a little too short for me. Um, I didn't feel like the correct thing to do here um, for several reasons. However, um, I, I actually, I hesitate because when you say that the Philippines is not settler colonial, I think it's interesting to think about the Philippines as a nation state and the ways in which we understand who is considered indigenous and who is not in the ways in which also, um, and this is a word that of course people were using also in the minds when they said, oh, I'm a settler from Kalinga, or I come from this place, I come from Pangasinan and I settle here. And of course that carries a different meaning. But also when we think about um, the people who come to settle in a place, it's also right, um, the ways in which politically, culturally, economically, they overtake um, indigenous people. And I think, this is why I'm hesitating to say this, because I feel like this might be controversial. Um, I would say settler colonialism is at work here in the Philippines. And I would say that to say it is not a settler colonial place would not be quite, I feel like there's nuance to it, right? I don't think the definition of settler colonialism, well, I think it does extend to the Philippines when we think about it. Um, Philippines is not, the Philippines is a nation state until um, colonialism and then the ways in which the Cordillera as well was not the Cordillera until American colonial period and the ways in which people's identities begun to come together. Um, and the ways in which also people come to settle here and, and how does that displace um, IEPs or how does that displace indigenous people here? And that's why I say that um, in the beginning, this idea of this set of relationalities or responsibilities that people have, there are a lot of people who come to Latvia. And I think it depends on who you talk to, but that could be also seen as other colonialism and the ways that they take places in economies, um, taking over certain things, right? And it's uncomfortable. 
And that's what is talked about, right, in decolonization is not a metaphor, right? This idea of incommensurability, this uncomfortableness with discussing political colonialism in that way. Um, what would you say, how do people identify in Hmong I don't think people would use the word indigenous. And I think that's why also um, throughout this process of writing and throughout this process of creating this presentation, I had the hesitancy around using indigenous studies as a framework, but also like that was my training. Um, so I think mean, when we talk about like how do Hmong Thai and how do people identify, right? People identify more based off of their ethnolinguistic group or where they come from, where their hometown is from. And so maybe indigeneity in that way is not a generative concept um, for to identify people by that way, right? But then I also think that there is a lot that indigenous studies lends um, to thinking about the complex relations that people have to place, particularly in mining communities, because they're not um, you know, mono uh, ethnolinguistic groups of people from all over. So like Mongkayan is right? And also there are some um, from elsewhere, but there's actually a lot of people from Mountain Province and a lot of people from Palunga. Um, and to think about what it means, right, to come from elsewhere, you know, and if you're from the Cordillera as well, to mine um, and take part in extracting resources. And so I think it's complicated and I think it requires nuance in that way. Um, wait, to remind me of the second part of your question, is there, okay, what did I answer for you? And then what is, what comes up after I share that with you? What are the other questions that we may have? I think that's, uh, that's it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, okay. Um, any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for coming. Um, and also thank you to everyone on my team as well. Thank you to my family who's here for coming and my family online. <laughs> um, if you have any further questions, please feel free to ask me. Um, I am accessible by email. Um, I'm actually returning to Hawaii on July 20th, uh, sadly, so it's my last presentation. Um,